Our first big assignment is to do a grid-based self-portrait. And we're really doing it as a way to really dive in deep to optical color mixing, color interaction, and all the different kinds of nuances that happen when we're using color to represent form, to depict things that occupy space. Why are we doing a self-portrait? Well, partly because this is a project that works best when we're doing a face. And I have discovered in the past that students try harder on a self-portrait because this is a project that gets a little bit tedious and therefore we need something that's going to keep you engaged. And while you think you like that musician, movie star, creepy guy who keeps following you around the campus, whatever it is, you're going to get bored with it. And yet, if we do a self-portrait, one of the things that I've noticed is that students try harder because they care how they are depicting themselves in the world. Also, self-portraits are kind of interesting in the way in which artists use them to communicate something not only about themselves, but also the society that they're part of. So we're going to spend just a little bit of time talking about self-portraits, and then we're also going to talk about how the project itself is going to work. We're going to start with this, Jan van Eyck's Man in a Red Turban, that is generally believed to be a self-portrait. Though we don't absolutely positively know that, we have a number of context clues, both in this work and in his oeuvre overall throughout our history. What is he trying to do in this painting? Well, one thing he's trying to do is to essentially give himself a showpiece, something that he can show to potential patrons about the level of care, the accuracy with which he is going to render an image. He's also positioning himself in very specific ways as a sophisticated man who is part of the court of Burgundy at the time. So he is a public intellectual, a role that wasn't always something that artists ascribed to or were allowed to be, but he is also going to act as an ambassador for the Duke of Burgundy in addition to being the court painter. So he is sort of positioning himself as this sophisticated, worldly individual. And we can see that through the wealth of the fur-lined coat that he's wearing and the awesome hat. I really think these need to make a comeback. One of the other things that's kind of interesting that he's doing is we see the original frame. And on the frame, he not only painted his name as a signature, but gives us a very specific date. And at the top, he's making a little joke. Als ich kann. The three words that you can see at the top say als ich kann, which is shorthand for a Germanic Dutch phrase that basically means, eh, it's the best I could do. Uh, as I can, als ich kann, is not only a phrase that we use that's the um, 15th century equivalent of, eh, good enough for government work. It's also a pun on his name. Als ich is sounding very similar to Eich. So as John van Eyck can, which happens to be a whole lot better than you. So there's this kind of bragging quality to the way in which he is depicting this face and letting you know that he can depict this at this level. One of the things that's kind of interesting then is that at this point, a believability, an optical illusion that is going to went over the viewer as looking almost real was what art was trying to achieve at this point. We're going to see, though, that as we move into contemporary artists, we're not always intended to trust what we see. Because if you think about it, what I look like is not my fault. My face is a conspiracy between genetics and, I guess, nutrition so that I look a certain way. But who I am might be very different. And we can see the way in which this is manifesting itself as a psychological self-portrait here by Gregory Gillespie, where he does have a optically faithful, if unflattering, 
concave chest and all depiction of what his face looks like, but within the painting within the painting, we can see the sort of psychological state of how he is feeling. Is it going to surprise you if I tell you that Gregory Gillespie died by committing suicide? If we look at the way in which his psychology is coming through that self-portrait that he's painting, it seems like he is quite the troubled individual. The fallacy of images, the idea that we can't really trust what we see, is at the heart of the brilliant series of untitled film stills by Cindy Sherman, a photographer who started this in the late 70s and continued it into the early 1980s. And what she does is create a series of self-portraits, but each one is fabricated. She has dressed up in some sort of scenario. She has placed herself in a setting and giving herself costumes that call to mind classic Hollywood movies. There's this sense of expectation. There's this Hollywood, almost Hitchcock-esque framing of the composition, the way she's looking off to the side at whatever is going to be the thing that is going to disrupt the plot of the movie. And yet, if we see this series in context, if we see them together, we're going to realize after a beat that it's the same woman every time. And yet we stereotyped her. We assumed we knew something about her. In this case, say the innocent young girl in the big scary city based on context clues and cultural signifiers. But once we realize that the one who's the innocent girl in the city is the same model as the harlot who's smoking a cigarette in other examples or other um, scenarios that she's created, we realize that we are seeing a fabricated image that how she chooses to project herself is something that she is aware of and constructing. So sometimes a face isn't necessarily the only thing that we're trying to communicate when we create a self-portrait. Sometimes we use our body less as a self-portrait, talking about myself, and maybe more as a representation of my place in the world and the way in which Anna Mendieta and her Silhouette series is projecting herself into the environment and then leaving a trace of her former presence. So we have this disconnect between where she is and the fact that we aren't there anymore. And there's this kind of separation that happens because all we have left is the documentation of the flowers that make up her silhouette or the performance that she had when she was part of the tree using my own body for expressive means that aren't necessarily exclusively about communicating just the basics of what I look like. The idea of a psychological self-portrait is something that we can see in Jasper Johns. How do I know it's a self-portrait? Well, we have numerous references to the self, including the fact that his profile is one of the profiles that's included in this vase that we see. So we actually do have a self-portrait, but it's also my role as an artist. And so using the Mona Lisa as a signifier for all art or references to artworks that are in his personal collection. These are the things that I'm interested and influenced by, or this is actually not Jasper Johns's face. This is Leo Castelli, his gallery director. The owner of the gallery is going to be how people access my work is through the gallery. So if my paintings represent me and he represents my paintings, then I can include Leo Castelli's face in there. And there are numerous other references to his own artwork within this image. But I think the thing that really makes it clear that this is a self-portrait, if a psychological one, is what we're seeing down here, 
with the taps. Now, those of us who had the good fortune, question mark, of growing up in suburbia might not immediately recognize exposed plumbing that is so common in New York City where Jasper Johns was living at the time. But here we have the cold tap and the hot tap, and then they come together, and this is where the water comes out. And we can just barely see the edge of a tub because we are sitting in the bathtub. The only place that we would be able to see things from this point of view is if I'm soaking in the tub and either I'm in the bathtub with Jasper Johns, who's in his 80s at this point, so that's kind of creepy, or more interestingly, I'm in Jasper Johns's head. I am seeing the racing thoughts as he's having a soak and contemplating his own life and his mortality, and the way in which we're going to see all the different ways in which art is going to manifest itself as a representation of him. So it's a self-portrait that is less about what his face looks like and more about what he's thinking, the racing thoughts that go through his mind.